Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Electronic Frontiers Forum at the Virtual Dragon Con 2020. We're all so bummed we can't be with you in Atlanta, um, but we're glad we can still talk to you from a distance. Our topic this hour is the problems with getting paid for your data. I'm joined by Meredith Rose from Public Knowledge and Harry Haley Sukuyama from the Electronic Frontiers Foundation. Um, we're coming at you live from across the country, San Francisco, Colorado, and DC. Um, do the two of you want to introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. I'm Senior Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge. Uh, I, we work on a whole slew of uh, tech issues from the consumer perspective. Uh, we're a consumer advocacy organization. And so that ranges from net neutrality to copyright to privacy. And I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I work, as you may guess from my title, on legislation, um, which involves a lot of consumer privacy uh, and also all of the other issues that EFF takes on uh, all across the country. Wonderful. And my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the executive director of the Silicon Flatiron Center, which is a research center working on law, technology, and entrepreneurship at Colorado Law School at University of Colorado in Boulder. And we're gonna jump right in um, in just a second. Before that, I'm gonna say just a big, huge thank you to Scott Jones, who's the organizer of the Electronic Frontiers Forum, does hero's work putting this together every year, and is, this year is doing even bigger hero's work because it's all virtual. Um, so a huge round, virtual round of applause for Scott and his team. Um, so the, the issue of getting paid with data has been one of those things that I, I feel like sounds really, really great to people for about the first five minutes that they've heard it. Um, and then slowly people start to think about it a little bit harder um, and realize that there's a lot of problems with it. So I'm really glad that we can jump into this idea today. Um, I was around the Davos Forum in January, which is this big forum with a lot of leaders in politics and technology and economics and some for some reason they let me in i just no idea why um but this idea was everywhere there people were like we're going to save this issue of privacy and we're going to do it by forcing companies to pay people for the data that they turn over and i thought that was really interesting um and so i'm going to turn it over um to haley and meredith to introduce what this idea has meant to them um what it is uh, and how you come across it and deal with it in your work from day to day. Okay, um, I'll start. We're like gently poking each other. <laughs> Gotta love a Zoom panel. Um, so yeah, I think, um, thanks for that uh, introduction, Amy. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, EFF has come across and I have come across this issue um, in similar ways. You hear it a lot from sort of thought leaders, you know, people who, who are um, sort of thinking about big ideas and, and ways to um, is to solve them. Um, in our particular case, you know, I think, uh, you know, this is also sometimes called a data dividend. Um, that phrase has popped up in the state of California. It came up in the state of the state address last year um, and gave a lot of us a little bit of anxiety. Um, and we see this idea kind of play across, to, uh, come across to in legislation. So uh, a lot of times, what we call it in, in that sphere is pay for privacy. So um, given all those terms, uh, just to break it down a little bit, I think, you know, it is this idea that, um, you know, companies are collecting your information and that information has a value. Um, and so, you know, they should be paying you the value of that money if they're going to use that information. Um, again, as you said, I see why that is appealing off the bat to a lot of people. I think, you know, you say, well, you know, I'm using Facebook, I'm using Google, um, they're making a lot of money off me, I want to see a cut of that. Um, it feels righteous in some way. But um, if you think about it, you know, just a little bit longer, um, you know, it really sets out what I think is a very dangerous sort of commodification of privacy. It makes you think of privacy, which is, um, you know, really, we believe a fundamental right um, as something that you should, you can trade away. Um, and if you think about practically who, uh, you know, how this would look, um, it plays out in a couple ways. Um, 
you know, one, companies would likely be the ones setting the value of your data. Um, are they going to do it fairly? If it's not companies who can address that fairly, that's a, that's a question, right? Um, who would be incentivized to pay for data? So you could definitely see, you know, people getting, um, you know, saying, okay, look, I really want $5 off or $10 off my cable bill every month. Just take my information and give me the money. Um, that really, you know, I think unfairly targets low income people, um, people of color. So those are the communities that I'd be most worried about. And also um, your data tends to be most valuable when you are most vulnerable. So if you look at sort of um, most expensive Google AdWords rates, for example, right? It's things like mesothelioma, flood insurance, right? These are sorts of, these are sorts of times when you really don't necessarily want people to be, um, you know, they're just at a very vulnerable time in their life. And so you, you don't want to uh, be taking advantage of those kinds of situations. That's bad. So um, that's sort of my initial rant in a nutshell. And I will turn it over to Meredith. That is, that is a fantastic framing. Um, so I'm just going to shamelessly piggyback on that. Uh, a couple of different things that I think, you know, we think about when we think about, uh, you know, treating data as property specifically. Um, so there's a couple of different things. Uh, one is that if you're a lawyer and you hear property, alarm bells go off in your head because I think non-lawyers have a hard time understanding just how complicated and fraught property is as an area of law. Uh, we all have to spend a year on it when we start in law school. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy sort of derivative uh, doctrines about property. Um, you know, you can do a attachments and and uh, future it's just a crazy it's, it's a sort of wild area of law in which a lot of the ancillary parts of it just are never going to map well onto personal data um, and you know sort of one of the thrusts of anglo-american law throughout the ages has been encouraging people to be able to freely trade property and the corollary of that is well what's the problem we're actually trying to solve uh, when we're talking about getting paid for your data. Uh, we're trying to create a disincentive. We're trying to deter companies from collecting it. We're trying to attach a penalty to it so they'll do it less. Um, so from a policy perspective, that's opposite sort of how the law traditionally views property. Um, it also you know, doesn't do much given the competitive landscape that we've got right now. We've got a couple of, you know, when people think about privacy harms, usually they're thinking of a couple of discrete companies like top of mind is going to be Facebook. It's going to be Google. Um, depending on who you ask, it might be Apple or Microsoft, but you're really going to get mostly the big name companies in there that have a lot of market leverage. Um, they're not going to stop collecting data. They'll just be able to set the terms on which they collect your data. And they kind of do this already um, with their terms of service and their privacy policies, which they can just set unilaterally. Um, and to cap that off, I think even from even sort of a more critical perspective, um, companies like ISPs right now uh, can freely collect the data that is sent over their network. Um, this has been a long running front in the privacy debate, specifically since the Title II net neutrality fight kicked, uh, really sort of kicked into high gear back in 2015. Um, it's one on which I worked a lot. Um, but the law has historically looked at these sort of uh, services like the telephone network, where you as a customer have to give a lot of very important data to this middleman in order to use their service in the first place. And it's a critical infrastructure uh, from sort of the policy perspective. So you have to give the phone company, you know, the number you're dialing to, the number you're dialing from, the time of the call and the duration of the call. Um, you also have to trust that they're not going to actually listen in on the call, uh, which is a whole nother issue. But that's a lot of information that they can then sort of derive about who you're calling and for what reason and for how long. They'll know if you're calling your church. They know if you're calling Alcoholics Anonymous. They know if you're calling your mistress. They know if you're calling the IRS. Um, and that gets exponentially more complicated and granular when you're talking about IP addresses over a broadband provider. Um, and right now, sort of a lot of what we're seeing is, or a lot of the, the sort of pushback um, when we got into this privacy discussion on the ISP side was, you know, exactly what Haley mentioned. It's, well, we'll give it at a discount if they, you know, if folks want uh, a discount, they'll just let us collect their data. 
And what this ends up doing is it really targets vulnerable communities, a lot of lower income communities, um, minority communities, communities of color, um, who are already the most vulnerable and the most heavily data mined among all of them. Uh, and, you know, it's you can pay a pre I think Verizon for a while had a, uh, a special plan where you could pay premium to not have your data harvested. It didn't last terribly long, but it did exist for a moment. Um, and there was a premium on top of it. It was it was considered like a, you know, gold level plan. Um, you know, so if we're going to have privacy available, it needs to be sort of meaningly available to everybody. So Meredith, I now I'm about to make a lawyer joke. I apologize to all non-lawyers, but I really want a shirt that says you cannot adversely possess my data. <laughs> I have not abandoned it. <laughs> I would wear that shirt, unironically. <laughs> Um, so I would wear that shirt if someone explained it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of those weird archaic property things that Meredith was referencing <laughs> that law students all hate. Um, so one of the things that I love most about these panels at Dragon Con is that we get to interact with a very awesome and well-informed audience that gets to ask us questions. So the three of us threw on Twitter, what questions do you have for us? And one of the first things I got was from at Jim Fenton, who is of course Jim Fenton. And he says, is there a difference between getting paid for your data and being charged extra for not sharing it? Um, AKA the situation with grocery club cards. And I, I asked this now because I think these two different concepts came up in both of your opening remarks. And so to ask you to kind of pull the strings between a company paying you to provide information or a company charging you a premium for not turning over your information. Um, and if there are maybe slightly different interests involved with each of those two very related, but, but slightly different topics. I see we both have our thinking faces on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'll jump in a little bit um, to begin with, because the kind of loyalty club question did come up in the state of California when we were looking at um, amendments to the CCPA last year. So, um, you know, there was a big sort of um, worry that the CCPA was designed to get rid of loyalty clubs. Um, and I think people like loyalty clubs, right? Um, <laughs> in, a, in a lot of ways. And so there was, there was some concern there. Um, you know, at, at to answer the first part of the question, I think they are very similar, actually, giving a discount for um, for sharing your data versus getting paid for your data. Um, you know, one is maybe a little, um, like, feels a little more default in terms of the payment that comes to you. Um, but I, I think, you know, functionally, they are, they are very similar. Um, when we're talking about um, club cards and loyalty clubs, um, you know, I think in, in all the privacy legislation that we put forward, we want to be really sure that people aren't discriminated against for exercising their privacy rights. So that sort of, um, you know, that also plays into this this uh, conversation. Um, loyalty clubs is, is kind of a tough one, right? Because that is people are saying, okay, I have a relationship with this business. I'm opting into this relationship. Um, you know, I want my 10th cup of coffee free. Um, and so, uh, you know, sort of where we came down was, okay, if you, you know, that's a, that's a knowledge thing, right? Like if you know what the company is doing with your information, if they don't sell it without your permission, because that is also, that plays very much into this, into this question, right? Because um, if they're collecting the data just to reward you for showing up at their, at their store every day, um, that's very different than if they're selling it to data brokers, selling it to advertisers. And so um, it's a tricky question, and it's one that I, th I think I'm personally still thinking through, but that is how we sort of um, dealt with it in California. Yeah, the other thing I think to keep in mind is that l the degree and the breadth of data that we're talking about in both cases is very different. So a loyalty club, again, sort of putting aside the question of data brokers and aggregation, um, you know, if you're talking about the Starbucks loyalty rewards card they know what your what your starbucks order is and how frequently you come in and that's not to say you can't derive some information about a person from that but it's a very different scope than google caching all of my search history that's those are two very different scopes of problems um you know and if i decide that i'm uncomfortable with starbucks i can either leave the loyalty program or i can go shop at another coffee shop because i happen to live in the 
Washington DC area, so I have that choice. Um, obviously, the, none of these are hard and fast rules. You know, if you go down to where my parents live in South Carolina, there's one grocery store that's within an hour drive of them. So that grocery store is gonna, if they get a loyalty card, that grocery store is going to have all of the information about all the food they buy from which you can derive some not insignificant personal details. Um, but I think it's what we're, what we're concerned about is data generated online by these large services are often aggregated. They're aggregated and sort of, you know, in the case of Facebook, they are um, used to attract whole different swaths of advertising across like a multi-purpose spectrum. And so the incentive is to gather as much as you can about every individual customer as well as in the aggregate. So it's just a, it's a question of scope and scale. So we've hit upon a lot of issues already. Um, a few of them, like to put it into a scenario, um, I have some social media friend book that I want to participate in. And um, I want to turn over, you know, give them some of my data. Um, there's a question I think of, will they give it to somebody else um, in that secondary market that Haley alluded to? There's also a question that I think Meredith got at about, well, do I even need to give them my information or how much do I need to give them before they can start deriving more information about me? And do they have to, it, is that part of the information I've given them when they're actually just putting it into an AI engine and making either educated guesses or in some cases very wrong guesses? about me based on it. Um, so those are two big things that are very hard to go to. Um, another question that I got from Neil underscore Chilson um, is how do you define your data? That it could be easy for things like your name and your social security number, but what about conversations and interactions with others? And the fact that much of the data is collected is about how we interact with websites and what makes that exclusively my data rather than jointly owned data. And to pose a follow-up that was tagged onto it by at Economist Ivers is, is the language of ownership, mine, yours, ours, even the right paradigm in these conversations? Um, and does it really fit what we're looking at? Yeah, so the, the indirect data is an interesting question because this has definitely come up in the case of Facebook and like social networking where, um, and I, somebody can jump in and cut me off because I don't remember the exact details of this, but people found that when they signed, they had sort of held off of Facebook and when they signed up, Facebook already had like a huge swath of connections because Facebook had ac basically accessed the contacts networks of all of their friends surrounding them and had managed to derive a huge amount of data from that, basically that missing link in th that was the person who signed up late. Um, and it's an interesting question. Um, you know, to some degree, communal data is a, that's, that's an open one. There's sort of no good answer. I mean, I know that there's data that people can derive uh, about my husband who has quit Facebook about five years ago. He was truly a man ahead of his time. Uh, and I know that Facebook knows a ton of stuff about him, knows a ton of stuff about my three-year-old probably. Um, just by virtue of the handful of things that I and folks related to me have put on there. Um, so I don't know if there's a good answer to that, um, but it's certainly something that's an active, it's an active discussion right now in privacy. Um, and I think another good reason to kind of point out why this idea of getting paid for your data is so complicated and like maybe not the right solution, right? Because it is actually very difficult to tease out, as Meredith was saying. I think that's so right. And we, I mean, when we think about Cambridge Analytica, like the, the big incident that kind of perpetuated so many of the privacy conversations that we're hearing today, that was all data that your friends had. And how, how would you deal with that um, and getting turned over? And there, I think that there, again, as, as I started out, sounds really good. And then you start digging into these questions, like how do you solve these really, really hard problems? Um, I wanna go back to something that I found really interesting. So in addition to CCPA, um, former presidential candidate, Andrew Yang has put out a very detailed proposal about how demanding that companies should pay you for your data. Um, 
have either of you had a chance to look at that or could you provide any reactions to this idea that this should be now in federal law, um, that this idea and, and how that could even work? Um, I mean, with with respect to Mr. Yang, uh, it, it would not work and it should not be in federal law. Um, I think, you know, just because of the, I, I just, I haven't read the proposal as thoroughly um, as I could because it kind of came out at a time when I was super busy and not um, in the reading uh, extra stuff. I can't imagine that you have things going on <laughs> in the middle of all of this. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, legislation is, uh, it's been very interesting this year. That's a, a whole different thing. Um, but yeah, uh, but I do think, you know, just the idea is, um, is just not cooked um, and not good for everyday people. And I think it's very easy, again, to, um, it's easy to make slogans around. It's easy to sort of rally people around. But if you get into the nitty gritty, if you talk to anybody who works in privacy, if you talk to people who work, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a whole property lawyer thing that I don't um, know as much about, but you know, that, there, that it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, I do think, you know, probably for Mr. Yang, um, it, you know, he, he really made his name on sort of universal basic income. And so I, I think probably there are some echoes and parallels that, that he may see there as a way to, you know, just sort of get people um, more money in their, in their budget every, every month. Um, but, uh, you know, UBI is an entirely from a, you know, I sh maybe shouldn't speak unilaterally, but I can't think off the top of my head of privacy issues that I would have with UBI in the way that I do with, with data dividend, um, which just raises all kinds of alarm bells in my head. So. And I think the other thing that we kind of need to acknowledge when we think about why this idea has really just sort of taken off in the discourse as much as it has is that, um, you know, speaking as a lawyer who works a lot on sort of regulatory, sometimes very obscure issues, um, the American legal system is very bad at dealing with damage that does not have a dollar value attached. It's just, it, it is very hard to, I mean, you can talk to even folks who do antitrust law have to deal with this all the time. Um, that trying to explain that there is a non-monetary harm that is nonetheless very serious and that it is difficult to attach a dollar value to becomes a really, really uphill fight. Um, and so I think a lot of uh, folks in many spaces, frankly, um, but also in privacy have gotten frustrated with that and just said, fine, so we just need to attach a dollar value to it. Like if that's what it takes for this to make a dent, then let's just do it. Let's set a price. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of been a, you know, a feature or a bug, depending on who you ask, of the American legal system for well over a century at this point. Um, but that sort of economic reductionism, I think, is understandable, but it makes it very hard to have a conversation about what are the fundamental, like, intangible dignitary harms. Like, why do people have this ick factor when they think about how much, you know, some tech company or ad company or whatever has collected about them. Like, let's interrogate why we're upset about this and acknowledge that people are upset about it. And it's not because they think they're entitled to money that they're not getting. It's something else. So it's interesting that you say that. I, I just saw, um, I, I got an email recently about how I was implicated in a class action lawsuit by a now defunct social media platform that I will not name. And the value that they were offering me for my data having been compromised in this, this um, class action lawsuit was $12. And it was like, now they've put, they put a dollar amount on my data and my data is worth $12. So I find this just really interesting that that's what they're thinking is gonna really contribute to people's bottom line. Uh, Meredith, I think this next question is for you. Um, so you're on the hook. Uh, does paying people, as, as our lawyer, or our panelist lawyer, I will take myself out of the equation, and our property expert. Um, does paying people for their data create any fiduciary or contractual obligations or other responsibilities with respect to that data? This is from Brandy Bennett at B. Bennett Esquire. Well, B. Bennett ESQ. <laughs> so that is a really good question. Um... And the answer is, I think nobody has successfully done it yet, so we don't actually know. Um, this is one of those, a court hasn't heard it, so we don't definitively know what the implications of this are. 
Um, but there is actually, so the idea of data fiduciaries is actually an interesting one that has been proposed. Um, so Omri Ben-Shahar, who actually is my old contracts professor, which is why this came up on my radar in the first place, um, has proposed the idea of creating a fiduciary duty rather as sort of a substitute for paying people for their data, but just imposing fiduciary obligations. And for, for the non-lawyers in the audience, a fiduciary, to grossly oversimplify, a fiduciary duty is basically when a court says like, no, 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 you're acting on behalf of another person and another person's interests. And possibly, usually in the context of you're holding somebody's money, like you're a uh, investment fund manager or something like that, um, or you're managing their IRA. And because you have to act in their best interest and not in your own. Um, and so the idea would be of a data fiduciary would be to impose that kind of requirement on some service in in the chain of ownership or the chain of possession of your data. Um, it's an interesting one. I don't know to what extent that's sort of been taken up. Um, my understanding is it's still largely an academic idea, but it would be interesting to see sort of how that plays out. Yeah, I think we've seen the concept of data fiduciary come up in a couple of bills, but um, EFF's position is certainly like, it could be a tool in the toolbox, but it's not sort of the end all be all thing that, that we, um, we think would work right now. Maybe to, to pull on some of those strings, what do we need? So if this is, I mean, we'll go back to this a little bit more and, and spend some more time on it. But if this is not the answer, as, as, as we all seem to feel, what might help? Here. What are what are we looking for? What can people like latch on to as an idea? Um, so I'll jump in. Uh, you know, I think um, I mean the the is, the main issue that I have with data dividend um, is actually because it doubles down on a system that I think is not working for consumers, right? It's instead of saying, okay, let's try and fix the system a little bit, it says, well, let's just, you know, like double down on it and sort of throw you a paltry sum to make you okay with it. Um, a $12 for, for information that that company undoubtedly made more than $12 on um, <laughs> without naming names. Um, and so, you know, I think certainly what we do in our legislative work is we look at a, a few things, right? We look at sort of how do we change the way that data gets into the system, right? So if you want, if you want to say like um, opt in versus opt out, so me, instead of a company saying, okay, you signed up, we're taking all of your information, and instead of me having to go to them and being like, actually, could you not? Like, they, they could ask me before I feed it into the system, um, and so that that would help, right? That would, that would reduce the amount of information that I don't know is getting passed around into the system. Um, similarly for selling, right? So who are you selling it to? You know, if somebody wants to, um, if, I order from a food delivery app, they wanna share my address with the delivery person, that's one thing. If they wanna share my address with a marketing company, that's an entirely different thing, right? And that is, a, that is a decision that I should be able to make. So that sort of changes the system. Um, I think too, you know, and I'll let Meredith talk more about this, but you know, if, uh, um, if something bad happens, we have to change the idea of what people are entitled to, right? So, um, you know, if something bad happens and it's a breach, um, and you know you get a class action lawsuit, and it's hard to kind of assess what the damage is and what the value is, right? That's like that's a that's a problem. And so um, we are trying to look at different ways to, to have stronger enforcement and to make sure that people have actual remedies. So. Yeah, and part of that is you know it's, it's so often we hear about data breaches very late or not at all in a lot of cases. Um, you know, it's a really so there's kind of two components. There's, you know, preventing, like as Haley said, preventing that data from getting into that ecosystem in the first place. And then the second, and then there's sort of the intermediate step about how do you regulate, once it is in the system, how do you control what companies can and cannot do with it? Um, and that's where things like um, in ISPs, there the privacy rulemaking that the FCC attempted basically said like, here are categories of data, you know, here's like sensitive categories of data that you cannot turn around and pass to your marketing arm, basically. And the other thing to keep in mind for context is a lot of these companies like Verizon, I believe bought Yahoo for its, specifically for its ad arm. So a lot of these companies, uh, you know, have multifaceted components that include an advertising arm. Um, and the third thing is what do you do, uh, 
ex post after something has gone wrong? Like, what are the remedies there? Um, so one of the big fights is whether or not there's what they call an individual right of action. Um, and the idea behind that is like, when something goes wrong, whose job is it to enforce a penalty? Can an individual consumer sue the company that has leaked their data or malfeased in some way? Or does it have to be a state attorney general? Does it have to be the DOJ? The higher up on that sort of federal food chain you go, the harder it is to make sure that there is gonna be anybody who has the bandwidth to pay any attention to it. Um, at the same time, the lower you go, you know, companies are afraid of just sort of getting gang pressed with, you know, 9 million individual lawsuits if there's a data breach. And it might be, the argument is basically like, well, we don't know that the data was actually valuable or that it was harmful that it got out there. And, you know, we suddenly might be just by virtue of the fact that somebody's random access pin or whatever that has no context got leaked, we're now on the hook for millions of dollars. Um, so, all of these are kind of different ways of thinking about it. One of the interesting things to me, um, as someone who doesn't primarily spend her time in privacy, is that we're kind of in the, um, the buck wild phase of brainstorming uh, for some of the ideas about this. Um, like, well, maybe we need to go ban targeted advertising, or maybe we need to like attach taxes. You know, you get the very cutesy. I went to Chicago, um, so I'm used to really cutesy economist solutions to things. Um, you know, we'll just put a tax on it. It's fine. Interna internalize externalities and all of a sudden the market will solve itself. It doesn't actually work, but it's really fun to watch them try um, until it's not funny and it becomes tragic. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of out there ideas right now, you know, of varying degrees of, oh God, no. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a vibrant, uh, I don't know that there's sort of one, I think if we'd found the answer to this, if we found the one correct answer, I think um, we would all be much wealthier than we are right now. <laughs> Probably not working public interest. The um, one ring to rule them all. <laughs> as long as it's not a ring doorbell, we're fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of kind of, you know, I don't want to call them crazy ideas, but crazy ideas that are being thrown around uh, right now. So, you know, hopefully we'll get sort of narrowing closer to something that looks like a solution. So we're in our, our last 10 or so minutes. Um, I want to, we got this really interesting question from Jamie Clark at Jamie XML. Um, content and software companies want to license their data to you, not sell it. Um, and it reestablished a lot of law um, you get to use my stuff for a limited time and purpose. So in this conversation, um, as we talk about selling data, should, if at all, we be talking about renting, letting people rent our data? Is that, is that a better solution here? <laughs> as a copyright lawyer, I primarily, I have to say the idea of licensing anything makes me hurt on the inside. Um, bring back in this case, I will say bring back ownership straight up. No, it's, uh, I mean, that's a question of enforceability in a lot of cases. I think intuitively it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you're saying you can keep my data, but only for 12 months, at which point you must delete it. How do you check that that's actually being complied with? Um, you know, even if you're a state regulator, how do you check that all of the vast multitude of people who are aggregating or collecting or come into possession of this data you know, even down to like small websites, how do you check that they're actually doing, you know, complying with their obligations to the law? That's a really tough thing to do, especially when anybody can set up a website. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I'm saying it's, there are huge like practical hurdles to overcome in implementing something like that. Um, yeah, and I think it, it still, you know, draws on a lot of the, of the problems that, that we've identified, right? That, that doesn't necessarily change the, the impact that it would have on, you know, on who uh, would be impacted adversely by something like that. Um, and I think it also sort of gets to this idea, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I, I have a job, I don't necessarily want to be managing all the license, uh, all the licenses for my data with all the companies that I may want to be interacting with, right? Um, I think, you know, again, the solutions that we're focused on are, are very much about changing the system because I think the system is just not really good for consumers, um, even if you, but I, I commend the creativity. <laughs> so our last, our last question, which I'm going to throw out and then actually ask you both um, to respond to it, but also to kind of wrap us toward our end. Um, what are the, the remarks you want to leave 
our viewers, our audience, our virtual crowd with? Um, because I think it's interesting. We started this, and Haley, you talked about, um, in general, this can be a really predatory practice um, for, for communities who are specifically um, at risk for being preyed upon. And so we have this question from Kelly Schroeder at I Will Leave Now. Um, do you think there are ways to mitigate the class disparity issue if we did choose to monetize data in this way? So more, would monetizing data this way allow for more accountability in data use um, such that we could mitigate the disparate impact of data misuse on more vulnerable communities? So really, I want it's, it's flipping that on its head, um, asking if we can do better by people if we take this approach. And I thought that that was a really interesting way to lead you into your closing comments because we have spent a lot of time, I think, saying why this is so bad, um, coming back and saying, could this actually be better for people and allowing you to respond um, in two minutes each, if you can. Um, okay, that's, that's, I mean, that's very interesting. I think, um, I mean, maybe if there is a, a thing that I, that I do draw from this debate, it is sort of what Meredith was saying was like, it does give people a way to kind of wrap their head around, um, you know, some way of, if you think about personal data, it can feel very nebulous and like very abstract. And so it does sort of make things concrete. Um, I, you know, I, I personally don't really see a way that we could use this to decrease disparate impact. I think just given the way that companies have behaved, um, that we've seen them behave, the way that, uh, that you know, I, I think that, um, you know, if past is prologue, I just don't see a good way that that this would um, that this would help disparate impact. I, I really only see ways that it that it would hurt, um, that it would exacerbate sort of the the bad things about the system. But um, you know, I I do appreciate again that you know the people are are thinking about it, and you know, I, if anything, I really um, think that this whole conversation and um, and what I do appreciate about it is that, again, it's, it's sort of making people think about it. It shows to me that people are thinking about privacy and they are thinking about solutions together. Um, and so I do really appreciate that. Yeah, that's actually pretty, pretty spot on to what I was going to say. Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, so when I was working on the, um, you know, the, the FCC privacy proceeding back in 2016, uh, which was passed and then fell victim to the election and then got repealed by Congress, rest in peace. Um, you know, a lot of advocates were just now starting to develop like even a vocabulary to talk about what kinds of harms, like how much data, like what is the real damage of an ISP being able to see every IP address that you look up? And are you just voluntarily giving that to them anyway? And da da da, you know, and getting that groundwork discussion kind of out of the way. Um, and just coming up with common terms so that we can articulate these ideas at each other. Um, you know, and I think the, I think the it's sort of where we have landed right now is we've got a pretty good map of like the different discrete pressure points on this. Um, I think we're still disagreeing about what the ultimate goal of privacy legislation is. Um, a lot of folks, kind of see it as a way to stick a thumb in the eye of tech companies, um, you know, sort of unrelated to actual privacy harms in a lot of cases. And I think a lot of times making people say like, you must pay for people's data is really a way of doing that. Um, you know, which is kind of silly when you think that that's just gonna be a drop in the bucket for you to know, $12 a person coming from a defunct social network from one of the biggest tech companies in the world. Like, eh. um, so, you know, I think right now we really are in this kind of like wild west of all the crazy ideas. People are really throwing ideas at the wall um, to see what sticks. And a lot of times when there's privacy legislation, it goes through these hugely iterative processes um, and there'll be competing bills that take slightly, you know, that'll maybe just say one of them has a private right of action and one of them doesn't, but otherwise they like kind of look the same except to privacy advocates who see all the little like nitpicks in it. So it's a really vibrant area right now. Um, and I think everybody has realized sort of post Cambridge Analytica, they have a stake in it. Um, and sort of what I'm hoping is that privacy advocates and policy folks that we can better communicate why we have come to the decision 
that or the positions that we have that this is you know paying people for their data treating data like property not a great one um some of this other stuff may be a little more open for debate you know but we can't sort of assume that people when they jump into the conversation are going to jump into it as far through the book you know of the discussion as we are um so hopefully you know it's going to be vibrant for a bit um i'm sure as new technology comes out it'll be even crazier on some new fronts um, but yeah, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna keep rolling. So hopefully people will just keep staying engaged and stay red. So I don't know how to tell time because we have 10 more minutes and I just asked you for closing statements. So I'm going to do something that I really like would have actually preferred to do with my extra time. Um, so thank you for those lovely closing statements. Now to follow them up, um, because this is virtual Dragon Con. And a panel wouldn't be a panel if we didn't give people something to do. What is their action item? What is their takeaway? And Meredith, I think you led us into that very well. Like this call to action, but what is that? Even if it's just something they can read to educate themselves on this issue more, um, something to point them to, something to support or not support, what is the, their, their next step in this long conversation? So my, my perennial recommendation is to find groups that are working on this issue even if you don't agree with them, follow their blogs. Um, there is a great blog at Public Knowledge written by a former colleague of mine, Dylan, Dylan Gilbert, that literally just is just this panel. It's why treating data like property is a problem. You know, it's, uh, you can sort of be summed up as like, we get that it's a problem, but this ain't it, chief. Uh, and it goes through all of the sort of breakdowns of like why people will say like, oh, but copyright, and he just, you know, which hurts me on my soul. Um, and he goes through and shoots that down. Um, so, you know, follow the blogs, follow people on Twitter, privacy Twitter, ironically, privacy people on Twitter. There's some inherent tension there. Um, but uh, all of us privacy people are very online, which is, you know, a thing, <laughs> it's a thing to chew on. Um, but follow those conversations because like we all get into it all the time and it's the, the discourse with a capital T and a capital D is very vibrant. Um, so just, yeah, follow along, sort of make up your own mind, read the different perspectives on it and see where you fall. Um, well, I mean, I think that's exactly right, uh, you know, and <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, there are, I mean, there are a variety of, of thoughts on this, so, um, but you know, I'm, to kind of uh, harp on things I've already been harping on, I think when you, when you see ideas like this, when they sound good, you know, just kind of like try and take yourself out of your own worldview a little bit and just think about like how it would affect people who live differently than you. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I think a lot of times when I see particularly legislators come up with ideas or they've, you know, talked to someone who, you know, at a party or came to their office and like pitched them an idea, um, they say, oh, that sounds good. And they just kind of like put it in a thing. Um, and they don't really think about, okay, well, how does that look for someone else? How does that look for, you know, someone who looks different than me, who has a different income than I do? So, um, you know, just sort of think critically. I think we're at a moment in this country where a lot of people are thinking differently about a lot of institutions along those lines. And so privacy is, as much about equity as you know as a lot of other issues so i think that's um that's also a, a good way to to approach it thank you both so much this has been a truly a pleasure thank you for putting up with my crappy timekeeping and thanks to everybody on twitter who gave us questions so that we could interact with you even though we're not there with you um really really great seeing you both i hope to see you back in atlanta next year fingers crossed um Lots of love. Take care, Dragon Con. Thanks, Amy. Thanks.